people are talking a lot about the voice of the customer. This is definitely a segment or a domain where we need to analyze some tools and some possibilities. It's not a technical question. At the end of the day, it's, it's more an organization, a human process. What do we do with the feedbacks we are getting from our customers? How do we define some actionable insights that we can fix and adjust? Hello and welcome to the 25 Days of Transformation series, where we talk to industry experts and global brands about the highs and lows of digital transformation. We'll learn from real-world business examples, get first-hand industry insights from the digital experts, and we'll take a deep dive into what trends to look out for in the coming months. I'm Tizzy Philp, Strategic Content Lead here at Valtech, and I'm here to guide you through these conversations and to uncover the latest and greatest in digital. Today, I'm joined by Peter Simon, Head of Web and Digital Solutions at Seeker Group. Seeker Group is a specialty chemicals company with a leading position in the development and production of systems and products for bonding, sealing, damping, reinforcing, and protecting in the building sector and automotive industry. Seeker has subsidiaries in 100 countries around the world and manufactures in over 300 factories. Its 25,000 employees generated annual sales of 8.1 billion Swiss francs in 2019. And at the end of 2019, Seeker won the Swiss Technology Award for groundbreaking new adhesive technology. Together, we will be discussing the impact of a global website relaunch during a global pandemic. Note that 80% of the rollout was done after lockdown across 100 or more country websites. So Peter, welcome to the podcast. Good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction. It would be great to set the scene a little here. Please, could you tell us a little bit more about your role specifically and the digital journey that you're on at Sika? Absolutely. So as I said, I'm Peter Simon. I'm based out of Zurich and I am the team head of digital solutions and web and working for the global IT team of Sika as a centralized uh, technical organization looking after many different systems and projects. And in my humble opinion, Sika is probably the one of the best place to work for on planet Earth with the growing number of companies, with a growing number of employees joining every day our organizations through acquisitions and the variety of cultures and languages and time zones we have to deal with which is also a nice challenge. A lot of different expectations and a lot of different level of expertise you have to deal with as an IT manager. But on the other hand, it's always beautiful to see when when a project like the website launch project gets rolling and one by one, all the countries can start benefiting from the latest features and technologies we are able to provide them with. So you'll have to get ready for an influx of uh, applications now after saying that to your <laughs> to your job site. You've been rolling out a massive global website relaunch during the pandemic with more than 100 local websites, as I mentioned in the introduction. Can you tell us about this rollout and about the obstacles you've been coming across along the way? Absolutely. So a little bit of history. We started the whole project way before the pandemic. It was, I think, on my very, very first day, a historical moment for myself on the 1st of February 2018, when we kicked off our partner selection process, where at the end we were choosing Valtech as our local AM implementation company and for the future. And throughout the whole project, when we started to talk to stakeholders, to regions, and also to countries, we realized that on one hand, everybody is looking for the same. Everybody wants to have a completely new website, a brand new, modern, and easy to use customer touch point to drive sales and customer satisfaction. On the other hand, we also realized that even the Latin American countries, they are so much different when it comes to expectations, requirements, the local markets, languages, time zones, the way of thinking, the way of thinking about customer engagement itself, that we had to incorporate tons of different uh, requirements talking about the business. So it was definitely a huge challenge for all of us. The second challenge, which I have to highlight here, is, is definitely the fact that we are talking about 100 countries, but in terms of expertise and in terms of resources, 
these companies are completely different. So they're talking about companies maybe with a couple of employees doing everything for the one single country. And on the other end of the spectrum, you can find companies like Germany, UK, or uh, US with an army of marketing experts, with an army of salespeople, and of course, with really, really complicated use cases. So these were definitely the, the obstacles. On the other hand, trying to engage with a completely new partner who has never done a single project for your company, it's always a big risk. And we were choosing Waltec over a company which, which could have been the obvious choice, so to say, but I think we made a really, really good decision. And one of the reasons why we were choosing you, and if, if I could give you a little story about it, when the pitch was in progress and we invited all of our candidates to do a final simulation of a one-day workshop, so really to understand not the expertise, what they are bringing to the table or the experience, but how we can work together as human beings eight hours a day, how the, the chemistry between us could work out. And one thing I realized with your team was they were able to say no. They were able to challenge us. They were able to sit down and look into the eye and just say, no, what you are aiming for is not achievable, but we have a different opinion and we have a different recommendation. This is something I've never really experienced in my career before. And I think I have been long enough in the IT project management business to realize the fact that this is this is something unique. This is the culture exactly what SICO will need in the future. We need to be challenged. We think we are special, and in some ways we are absolutely special compared to other uh, chemical and manufacturing companies. But we definitely need a partner like this who has a strong opinion to challenge us and to say no. So that was, that was definitely a huge um, differentiator factor in choosing uh, the future partner. And when the work began, one of the first things we also realized that uh, IT and business have to work hand in hand. So we are not enemies. We are not different departments. At the end of the day, we are the, we are the same company. We should have one spirit and one overall objective. And we started to spend more and more time together, also privately sometimes. And, and we realized that we have so many things in common. And we are sitting in the same building. So this is a really, really unique situation where you can find your business, marketing, communication experts, and also the hardcore IT guys, the dark side of every corporate business in one single physical place. And after a couple of weeks starting the project, we also realized that we are basically spending 50% of even more of our time with business people. So we started to change our language. We started to understand a little bit better what business really wants. And on the other hand, we also realized that business started to use the most complicated IT abbreviations you can ever think of. And after a couple of weeks, we were able to speak the same language. I think that was in terms of culture and uh, why man point of view difference. This was, this was a huge change maker in terms of bringing people together, understanding what we want and trying to work together as a team and trying to forget the organizational structure, the enterprise put on, on the top of our little project team. And then talking about the pandemic and the whole COVID situation. So this was definitely something nobody has seen before and nobody was really prepared for. And the whole COVID situation really kicked in, I think in January this year, First, it started uh, with China and all the Asian countries. And SICO also, as a global company, we were just getting more and more news that this is, this is something getting big. In February, it, uh, Europe was hit and all, all of our countries here. And by end of March, I think the whole US and Latin America was completely covered. And we were shutting down offices, shutting down factories. Uh, people were a little bit afraid of what will happen with their life, with their health situation, with their families, and also with their job at the end of the day. So it was definitely not the best timing for this virus or the whole pandemic. We were just in the middle of our project, so we were done with the implementation. We were done with the heavy lifting, and it was time to roll the project out. And we were already live with a couple of countries, bigger ones, sometimes smaller ones. 
we were heavily working on a, on a process to industrialize the whole rollout. So we were given a hard deadline. Hey guys, by end of July, all the countries should be live with the best in breed technology, with the latest website, and with the updated look and feel and user experience of our website. So we started heavily in March. I remember that clearly that we were just in the first day of the lockdown on the 16th of March, I think it was in Switzerland, and nobody really knew what to do now. We were just starting to have calls, chats, a lot of video calls. And we were quite lucky because we were just uh, switching in February from our old internal collaboration digital workplace platform to the new one, which we are using currently. At the end of the day, we also realized that Basically, we are a global company, but we cannot travel due to the pandemic, but it's not really needed. People are all at home. People are all working from the kitchen or from the room where they're supposed to work from home. But everybody was, after a couple of weeks, able to cope with the challenge, and, and we started to have fun. We also started to realize that more and more people are focusing on now the website project, and uh First, we didn't really understand what the real reason for that was. You have to go back a little bit and understand what our company is doing. We are a construction company. Construction business, when it comes to sales, is all about the personal relationship, the personal engagement with your customers, which was, starting from March, not possible for all the 100 countries we were doing business with. The second point is it's all about trade shows. All the trade shows were canceled. So there was no point or touch points anymore to build and maintain personal relationship with our customers, which also had a huge impact on our offline or trade show specific marketing teams because literally they had nothing to do because all the events were canceled. So we started step by step on a local level to transform these people from one day to another, from an offline trade show specific marketing specialist into a digital content creation, digital marketeer expert. And of course, it took a couple of weeks, but at the end of the day, it worked really well. And we just realized that countries are not really slowing down, but exactly the opposite. Countries are willing to go live. Countries are really investing the time, investing the money, investing all the resources, no matter what it costs, to make the go-lives happen by the end of July. And it started to become like a competition. So we communicated openly which countries are already live, which countries are still in the pipeline, and which countries might not make the end of July deadline. And countries started in a kind of a very positive way, a kind of a competition. Yeah, I would like to be the next one going live next week because we are ready. So we just had more resources. We just had more expertise from offline guys. And we are ready with the content. So content is obviously always a, a huge obstacle when you are doing the website launch project. Programming and implementation is a, just like the easy peasy. Of course, it's not. So this whole transformation or transition phase took place, I would believe, somewhere between March and April. And by May, we had a fully, full-fledged, really good rolling and working process industrialized process of bringing websites countries live with their productive instances. And at the end of the day, I think it's not a big surprise we made it. So I think July was a really, really heavy month for all of us. Um, probably more than 40 countries went live just in a time frame of four weeks. Even on the last day, on the 31st of July, I think we had 10 or 15 go lives with, with quite a big countries. But on the 1st of August, which is, by the way, the National Swiss Day, everybody was happy. We have done something nobody had ever done in the history of the company. So this was actually a huge milestone. And the, the feeling of success, I think it compensated in a lot of ways that we were not able to go on holidays. And we were just enjoying the happiness and the, and the joy of success. I think a lot of people will listen to this podcast and think, my goodness, if it's that easy, great. You've made it sound like it was, you know, a, an easy and a simple and a quick process. 
I know it absolutely wasn't. So we'll go back into some of those um, those points as we go in through the podcast. But you've mentioned some really important things as you were talking there about the need to break down silos across uh, the business and technology functions within the organization. So vital that you do that from the start. This need to rapidly respond to these changing conditions more so than with the pandemic situation, particularly when you have this really important customer relationship, trade show based uh, business model as well. I wondered if we could take a couple of steps back and just talk about the reasons for starting this program in the very beginning. What was it that triggered the need to start this website relaunch? As a construction company in the B2B manufacturing domain, when it's all about technology and digital engagement and touch points and digital transformation, probably in the domain of our business, most likely these companies are not the first movers. So of course, innovation is, is fundamental when we talk about our R&D department. Sika is all about innovation when, when we talk about our products. But historically speaking, and due to the nature of our business domain, construction is, is not typically the most advanced in terms of technology. But I see it maybe in a different way. So what companies did 10 years ago, and they had the whole time span of 10 years to improve them step by step, that whole digital transformation now has to go through, so to say, has to be enforced just in a couple of years to get there where we want to be when we talk about digital customer engagement. So in some ways, we are in a more challenging position that all the companies, they have started 10 or 15 or 20 years ago with the digital transformation. Because our customers are transforming as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Our competitors are transforming themselves quite fast. And this is, we take digital as a key differentiator between our competitors. They also got great products. We can also compete with the pricing range or sales techniques. But at the end of the day, what the real differentiator is, is the customer satisfaction and trying to put the customer first. So this is so to say, the introduction or the whole uh, space we were in uh, two years ago. We also understood that the website is the most commonly used information channel for all of our customers. And we had some massive user experience related issues, but people were just not able to find what they were looking for. And today's customer, whether it's B2B and B2C, and I don't see any huge difference because Fundamentally, you're working together with human beings and you're trying to give them a good proposition, a good value for the money or for other services. That people need answers immediately. People want to buy. They know sometimes exactly what they want to buy. If a company is not capable of letting the customers get themselves informed or um, buy the products, then that company will die sooner or later because the competition will just outnumber and outperform. So we focused a lot on talking to customers, doing a lot of surveys, doing a lot of interviews and questionnaires with real human beings, with real hands-on customers. And it turned out that we have to put in the future more emphasis on the whole information structure and user experience. And even though it's a conservative industry, and we are talking about products which are probably not that compelling from a visual perspective, we have to make it somehow in the digital pace visually compelling. And you're talking to engineers, to architects, to people who are working with figures, numbers, chemistry, and physics, and they really have to build something sustainable, a construction site or a building for the next 30 years, for example. And they are, these are really serious people, our, our customers. And how to find a way to talk to all of them, to segment, to customize our specific message to each and one of those target segments of our customers and to drive them through the really, really complicated structure of our products. We have more than 30,000 of them and to drive them exactly to the, to the answers they were looking for, to understand their problems first and then to drive into these, to the answers they are looking for. So this was, this was definitely, it, it took a lot of time for, for all of us. Trying to focus on 100 different countries and 100 different markets is definitely an additional challenge on the top. That's the 
cherry on the cake, how to serve the needs of all of our customers internally. It's actually something that we haven't touched on a lot uh, in the rest of this series yet. But for a business like yours, you have a very extensive product catalog, as you're just alluding to. How do you deal with the complexity of that in a simple way? Ooh, that was a long-lasting discussion with many of your user experience experts to how to target and how who do we talk to when there is a public website? Is it the B2C customer who is trying to fix a problem which he or she has at home, like a leaking roof or some cracks in the wall? Or are we talking to the architects who are building airports in a, in a large uh, German city? And of course, there are many additional segments and target groups and personas in between. And after analyzing uh, the needs of their personas, we were trying to understand what the uh, general customer journey of these people are. We came to the conclusion that everybody needs some kind of a general information or a general level of information, but we have to give the opportunity to everybody to choose between the different segments. By saying, hey, I am a retail customer. I need retail-related information. Okay, so then might be you're more focusing on things or problems you are trying to fix near your house. In another case, I'm a distributor. Okay, it means that you need to sell products, maybe to be to see customers, but it's another level of information. And the third and the fourth personas like architects we were defining we just understood that they need a different set of information, a different language. And maybe an architect needs a lot of uh, technical documentation. A B2C customer with his credit card in his hand, he needs to find a location to buy the product immediately. A B2C customer would like to buy only five of our products, let's say, to fix one small problem, which is a big problem for him uh, personally. On the other hand, a contractor is looking for another huge construction project it's not five products he wants to buy, but multiply by thousands and thousands. So balancing in, in between all those different customer expectations was definitely a huge and complex challenge. But thanks to the feedbacks uh, we are now getting from our customers, our countries, and also from our uh, potential prospects, we have found a way for the, for the right communication channels or the right language and the right set of information they might need. But I also have to say that this is not a one-time problem. So this is not something which we fixed on Monday, so we don't have a problem anymore starting with Tuesday. Actually, the real work when communicating to customers starts not really with the implementation of a new website. It starts on the first day after the go live. So let's say on day number one, you celebrated that the new website is there and how beautiful it is, and customers are starting to give you feedbacks. Mm -hmm. But not all of the, those feedbacks will be positive. Mm -hmm. So gathering those feedbacks and working on them and trying to improve your web presence every single day, that's the real job. And that was going to be my final question, actually, to you, Peter, because I feel like we could keep talking about this project for far, far longer than our designated <laughs> 25 or so minutes. But yes. clearly, after rolling out the website, there's still lots of work to be done. And as you say, once the feedback starts coming in, that's when things start to get a little bit more uh, complicated. But what are your priorities going forward? What's on the roadmap next? First of all, we have to put our customer first. We have to listen more to our customers. I think the engagement in terms of criticism, positive or negative feedbacks, this is something we have to improve ourselves. People are talking a lot about the voice of the customer. This is definitely a segment or a domain where we need to analyze some tools and some possibilities. It's not a technical question. At the end of the day, it's, it's more an organization, a human process. What do we do with the feedbacks we are getting from our customers? How do we define some actionable insights finally that we can fix and adjust from one day to another? Of course, the positive feedbacks we need to be positive about. And that's what gives us energy, I think, to wake up in the morning and to work towards customer satisfaction. So that's, that's definitely a, a huge topic. The next one is how to streamline our e-commerce channels, how to sell more and how to leverage the opportunity the pandemic gives us. 
if you take a look around in the B2C domain, e-commerce is just booming. But e-commerce, on the other hand, is not our primary uh, sales channel. So we are trying to find ways how to sell more through different market solutions, different external or internal e-shop capabilities and properties of Sika. The third point we are trying to focus next year is more on analytics. We are trying to introduce a so-called data-driven culture in our company that we are not just having discussions and putting arguments on the table based on our experience or based on the article I read in the morning, but every single decision should be based on numbers, on hard figures and on performance. We should calculate and focus more on ROIs and we should more put more emphasis on the entrepreneurship or the, the entrepreneurship approach of our business. And I think mirrored by lots of people who are lots of companies who've gone through a similar process and certainly very sensible things to be focusing on. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Again, I wish we had more time to talk because it feels like we've only just scratched the surface of what's happening at Seeker and what the the next few years are going to hold. But thank you for talking with us. Thank you for sharing all of that information. And we'll, uh, we'll be looking forward to watching Seeker's journey and your journey over the next couple of years. Thanks a lot for your time. Really appreciate it. You've been listening to the 25 Days of Transformation series from Valtech Cafe. If you enjoyed this podcast, then why not subscribe and keep up to date with all of the episodes in this series and a whole host of insights from the Valtech Cafe back catalogue. And if you'd like more information about what we do or to get in touch, why not visit us at valtech.com to find out the details. Until next time, thanks for listening.